Thank you. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Um, I actually just work right up the street at, at Harborview. I'm, I'm there five days a week, uh, and I'm, I'm fortunate that I live on First Hill, so I get to walk to work, and I got to walk over here, so I didn't have to worry about traffic. Um, so uh, I am indeed a neurologist. I'm not a neurosurgeon. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about how in the world did I end up being uh, one of the, the top guys in the world in the field of hydrocephalus. And it's that 30 years ago this month, I had started my fellowship in neurointensive care at, at Johns Hopkins. Uh, and back in 1989, there were only three places in the country that had neuro ICUs. There was Mass General, there was Columbia in New York City, and there was Hopkins. Um, Alan Roper didn't have funding for a fellowship. Columbia never answered my mail. This is when you had to write a letter and put a stamp on it, and, and Hopkins did. Uh, and uh, in a neuro ICU, you learn a lot about intracranial pressure and acute hydrocephalus, and I started to apply that knowledge of that physiology toward patients with ambulatory forms of the disease. And uh, if you know anything about academic medical centers, if you're junior faculty and you have a particular interest in something that's uncommon, where that nobody else is interested in, then every patient who comes through the Department of Neurology who might have hydrocephalus, in my case, gets sent to me. And, and that's how I, I started to, to build that uh, expertise and, and that clinical uh, expertise. And I reached the point after about 10 years where I went to my department chair at Hopkins and I said, you know, there's five other neurointensivists here, but there's nobody who's devoted exclusively to hydrocephalus and CSF disorders. <clears throat> and so I wanted to shift um, my area of focus, and he allowed me to do that. And a lot of my publications have started since that time. I came here to Seattle um, in, at the very end of 2015 and started at UW in uh, January 16. Um, roughly 80% of my time is, is clinical. I see patients five days a week, not all day, five days a week, um, and the rest of my time is, is for research. Uh, and it really is true that more than 95% of my patients are hydrocephalus, pseudotumors, stringomyelia, disorders of CSF circulation, who need the input of a neurologist. And, and what neurologists and neurosurgeons have to offer is complementary. Um, but there's a lot of things that we as neurologists do that neurosurgeons uh, either don't have the time to do or their practice is not designed for that. So uh, I like learning objectives and if uh, we were to give you a test at the end, you would be able to describe the four categories of adult hydrocephalus that I'm going to show to you. Describe the role of neurologists in the longitudinal care of adults with hydrocephalus and then explain for idiopathic normal pressure hydrocephalus why differential diagnosis is so important, and this is something that neurologists like to do. So you kind of know this. Anybody at any age can have hydrocephalus from neonatal uh, up to the 90s. Uh, and how hydrocephalus presents itself is different. And of course, there's been lots and lots written about hydrocephalus in children, and most of the adult literature looks at idiopathic normal pressure hydrocephalus, but there's a couple more categories in there that are not so familiar to uh, neurologists, or for that matter, to, to neurosurgeons. So I'm going to outline these four groups for you, uh, and it kind of gives you a sense of the world in, in which I live. Uh, so we'll look at that, and then I'm going to go very clinical at the end and talk about how do I think when a patient comes into me for the possibility of hydrocephalus. So um, the, the work on the four different groups is actually the combined product of these centers in the adult clini uh, hydrocephalus clinical research network. We formed this network about five years ago. The current centers are, are listed at the, the bottom. Uh, and the paper that you see is uh, from Journal of Neurosurgery, published at the very end of May, that looks at over 500 patients who came through. So this is really that work that I'm going to show you. And our first project was a registry. Patients come in, you do the same sort of exam and history on all of them, you get this data into a database, uh, and there's really only two basic entry criteria. The first is that they were referred for the question of hydrocephalus, either it was already diagnosed or it was suspected, and we said that on their MRI scan or CT scan, the Evans ratio had to be above 0.3. Uh, 
or they were previously treated for hydrocephalus, and the only exception to that was the possible INPH category, and that's because all the centers involved already had a bazillion patients with INPH, and we wanted just to go with new patients. Otherwise, we would have overwhelmed ourselves in the registry. Uh, it's not 100% enrollment. It, it just can't possibly be at, at the centers involved. And we chose intentionally to take in fewer patients so that we could get a complete data set on all of those patients. Uh, so each center has minor variations on how they, they do that. And then these are cross-sectional results. This is a single point in time. In fact, it's how they are at the time of enrollment into the registry. This is everything that we collected. Uh, and I don't expect you to read through all of that. Some of the tests are familiar to you, like the MOCA and, and a bladder score and 10-meter timed gait and so forth, and we looked at functional outcomes. Probably the most important thing is all patients got the same exams, and all the examiners, whether they were the physicians or the research coordinators, were trained to do them properly. So it, it's as rigorous as you can get for a registry like that. So here are the four categories. <clears throat> The first of them is transition. Around here, these are the kids who come out of Seattle Children's who've had a shunt since they were newborns, or maybe they got a shunt when they were in their teens because they had a tumor or trauma or something, but they were treated before the age of 18. So that's the transition group. And, and nationally, there's a big problem because when they leave the care of their pediatric neurosurgeons, the adult neurosurgeons just aren't interested in them. So there's a huge gap in healthcare services. The next is sort of related to them. This is what we called unrecognized congenital. There's a group of patients walking around out there who have had hydrocephalus since they were babies and nobody knows it until they bonk their head or have a headache and get a CT scan and everybody goes, oh, look at that. And some of them who come to us have already been treated, uh, but some of them have not. So we'll talk about that group. Next is acquired. Um, this is the trauma group, subarachnoid, brain tumor, maybe meningitis, and so forth. So hydrocephalus secondary to an inciting process. And the last is suspected INPH. These are the patients who were referred to us for evaluation of possible INPH, but they had not previously received surgical treatment. So these are the patients who walk in the door or shuffle in the door to see neurologists for this question of hydrocephalus. So I'm going to go through them one by one. Uh, and give you some highlights of, of the data. There's so much data in there, it's, it's hard to put it all together. And I will tell you, even though that I've been in this field for 30 years, I've learned a lot by going through the data, understanding the relationships among the groups. So transition's about 16% of the population across all of these centers, a little bit over one out of six patients. And if you look at their age range from age 18 all the way up to age 62. So that 62-year-old was a patient who was shunted probably back in the 1960s for pediatric hydrocephalus and had had no follow-up for a long, long time. And by virtue of the fact that that patient had been tr treated in childhood, they were classified as transition. And I will tell you that I've had patients whose shunts were older than I was at the time, shunts from the 50s. So this includes spina bifida and cerebral palsy and aqueductal stenosis. So you have this range of severely impaired adults, young adults with hydrocephalus, and some of them, in fact, who are very, very normal. Some of my young adults are college graduates and, and, and professionals. As a rule, if you look at their comor comorbidities or the causes of their hydrocephalus, their outcomes are worse if they have bad comorbidities. And it kind of makes sense. We know that. Uh, anything that injures the brain is going to add additional comorbidities on top of the hydrocephalus. And sometimes, in fact, it's really difficult to figure out what's the real cause of what's going on with them. A quarter of this group had epilepsy. And that also makes sense if you consider the, the etiologies. And then, of course, there's this entirely separate literature on epilepsy and quality of life. And in fact, there is literature in hydrocephalus that shows that having epilepsy with hydrocephalus severely diminishes the quality of life indicators for, for those children. Um, this group had the lowest educational attainment. We asked how far through school or college and so forth did they go. Um, some of them had uh, intellectual developmental delay. Some of them simply couldn't get through school because they kept going back to the hospital to have this shunt operation or that shunt operation. So between time in the hospital or the, the burden of being hospitalized, they were behind. And this has some lifetime implications on what they are able to do, whether they can be gainfully employed or have disability. 
these are the etiologies. There's no surprises up there. Myelomeningocele is, is at the, the, the top of the list. And you need to keep in mind that this is reflecting what was going on in um, uh, pediatrics 25, 30 years ago or more. So folate supplementation and so forth was just beginning in, in the late 1980s, early 1990s. And we had higher rates of myelomeningoceles back then. Aqueductal stenosis is, is next highest, prematurity, and, and so forth. And now this is busy, and if you're in the back, you're gonna to wanna to look at those, those big screens. Um, but this shows the, the scores, and I'm, I'm showing you all four columns, but for each of them, I'm gonna show you just the column uh, that uh, relates to that category. And I've gotta come over around here for a second so I can look at it. Uh, so this is transition, and so that we go the MOCA, symbol digit modalities test, Beck depression, gait velocity, Boone gait score, which is actually an NPH gait score, and then the last is a bladder score. And for each of them, I've indicated whether higher is better or higher is worse and, and so forth. Um, so uh, if you look at the MOCA, you know, it's the, the total numbers are, are not high for each of them, but there's a widespread, that makes sense, that's intellectual uh, delay. The SDMT scores are low, so the higher, the, the better there. Um, the gait velocity was measured only in those patients who could walk, so if they were permanently in a wheelchair, we don't have that, and we wouldn't have included them for that. Uh, interestingly, the, the bladder scores were good, and we realized in hindsight that we had taken into account those who either self-catheterized or had a, a mature conduit, a, a urinary conduit for that. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Quickly, tell us just a little bit about SMT and So the simple digit modalities test is uh, the neuropsychology equivalent of a decoder ring. Um, so you've got uh, the numbers zero through nine across the top and each of them has a symbol above it. And there's then a string of these symbols on, on the page and you give the patient a practice list and so they have to see, okay, is the thing that looks like a greater than sign, okay, that's a four and a one and so forth. And so it's scored by uh, the number of correct answers that they have over 90 seconds. It's actually a pretty sensitive tool uh, and it's been used as a screening tool uh, in MS, for, for example. Um, and so that's the SDMT. Uh, the Boone Gate score uh, was created for the Dutch NPH study in the early 1990s. I'm going to show you more about Gate toward the end, so don't write down Boone Gate score. I think there's a better system for it, uh, for, for what to do. So hold, hold that thought. Uh, I do both. I actually like the Tenetti score better than the Boone score for reasons that I will explain. Um, so now here are the functional scores. So Lawton ADLs and IADLs, which are pretty familiar to you. Uh, the Japanese have created something called the IMPH grading scale. So we said, let's use this for everybody. And then there's, everybody uses the modified Rankin scale. So we said, let's, let's do that. And again, I'm gonna show you just that column for each of them. And for all of these, lower scores are, are better scores. And you see for the Lawton, which I actually think is the best of them, you've got a lot of good patients, but then this spread across to the, the right showing a lot of patients who are impaired. And the thing I like about the Lawton is it asks, can you do this? Can you do that? Whereas the modified Rankin is sort of categorical. There's certain judgment that's involved in it. INPH grading scale is, is the same. And, and the Japanese INPH grading scale is about uh, 10 or 12 years old. I should say that um, there's been a tremendous amount of work done in Japan on idiopathic normal pressure hydrocephalus over the last 20 years or, or so. Um, and, and partly because of, of the, uh, the distribution of the population, the aging population is, is quite significant in Japan. And, and they're looking for ways to help to reduce uh, not only the, the disability associated with the disease, but to reduce healthcare costs. Now, for, I, I sort of hinted for this group that transition is, is important. Uh, and, and the whole area of transition from pediatric care to adult care for children with complex health issues has been around for about 20 years 
or so, and is tremendously underserved in neurology and neurosurgery, particularly for neurosurgery. Most of the patients who need this in neurosurgery are patients with hydrocephalus. Within that is, is the spina bifida population. Also in neurosurgery would be uh, spinal cord, brain tumors, and, and so forth. Um, most of these patients across the United States are just spit out of children's hospitals with nobody willing to provide care for them. And this is one of the reasons that patients find, who eventually find their way back to us have not had anybody paying attention to them for 10 years or 15 years or, or 20 years. And, and because I've been in this business for so long, I've seen what happens if somebody has not received attention for their hydrocephalus for a long, long time. They're getting worse over time, but because it's so insidious, they don't recognize it one day over the other, um, but sometimes they're coming back and they can't work anymore, and they're only 55, uh, or they're you know they're incontinent, and you know everybody says, oh well, you know that's just what happens, and nobody even is thinking that could that be the hydrocephalus getting in, into trouble for them. Um, the parents and and the kids, the the young adults, they are afraid of their pediatric neurosurgeons. I mean, there's a tremendous bond that that they have. Um, and quite honestly, we say this in the paper, and we, we held a summit to, to write this paper. Neurologists aren't trained about this. I wasn't trained about this when I was in residency. I know our residents are not trained about it, except that they get to spend some time with me. Uh, and so that's part of the national curriculum that we, we want to provide. I will tell you that most of my work for these patients has little to do with their hydrocephalus. If they're well, I'll see them once a year. I'll get a scan about every three years or, or four years. But it's just seeing them and making sure that their exam is stable. A year interval is long enough that if there's, there's a change, you can pick it up, but not so long that you've reached the point of having something irreversible for them. A lot of them are told, ah, just go to the ER. And that places a tremendous burden on the patients and their families to figure out, okay, is this headache or this belly pain the shunt or not? And, and I think that's the wrong way to approach it. And, and I really think that neurologists can provide a lot. It's not that you need to know how shunt works or anything like that. Neurologists are really good at managing patients for longitudinal care. Uh, and helping to be sure that they are well, I think, is a major contribution that, that we can add, depending on their they're going to need some, some other specialists involved in their care as well. I do a lot of referral to adult rehab because they've got a 10-year-old wheelchair or they, they've got spastic gait. Don't understand that 25 years of untreated spastic gait is going to lead to early hip replacement or early knee replacement and, and so forth. So understanding the consequences of unaddressed uh, spasticity or, or disability is important. So let's go to the unrecognized congenital group next. This is the, the group that I mentioned where they're walking around. Nobody knows they have hydrocephalus until they get a scan and sphincters get tight. The doctor's sphincters get tight because they, they, I don't know. the ventricles are big. What am I going to do about it? And most of the time, the worst thing you can do is send them to the nurse and say, oh my god, they need a shunt. You know, you got to take your own pulse first. Um, and these, this group, and I'm going to show you the scores in a second. They had the best function of all four groups. They had the highest functional scores. They had the highest scores for cognition and gait and so forth. Uh, a lot of them were asymptomatic when they walked in the door or minimally symptomatic when they walked in the door. So these are working age adults for the most part. Their etiologies tended to be really, really simple. Aqueductal stenosis is the most common. I'll show you those in a second. Almost two-thirds of them were untreated at the time of enrollment. A third of them already had been. They were just referred to our centers because we had the centers there. So interestingly, if you go around neurology or neurosurgery, there's not any consensus yet on what do you do with these patients. You know, if you shunt an asymptomatic patient, are you preventing future impairment or disability, or are you, you know, putting your hand into the hornet's nest because you just put a shunt in, into the patient? So there's, a, there's, there's true clinical equipoise on what to do with them. So here's their etiologies, um, aqueductal stenosis, almost 50% of them. Uh, my neurosurgery colleagues use this term. I'm not a big fan of it. It's aqueductal pattern. It may not actually be aqueductal stenosis, but what they call triventricular enlargement. So the lateral ventricles, the third ventricle are big, the fourth ventricle is normal. They say that's sort of an aqueductal pattern. I actually measure head size, head circumference. Uh, 
I'm really old fashioned. I, I have a tape measure. Uh, and I have an adult head circumference chart. So my definition of, of congenital hydrocephalus is they have hydrocephalus and their head circumference is more than the 97th percentile. And there's, there's a chart for that for adults. Uh, about 40% uh, of them were what we would call communicating hydrocephalus. Almost 55% uh, were so-called uh, obstructive hydrocephalus. <clears throat> Here's their scores, and again, from top to bottom, their mochas are really up there on, on the high end. The SDMT is on, on the high end. Uh, down at the bottom, the Boone score is really good. You know, almost all of them have a score of zero. A zero is a normal gait. Uh, and the bladder score at the very bottom, a lot of that is, is zero. Now, you know, some of these patients were indeed symptomatic, not all of them, but you can see that all of these scores are toward the better end. So this is the highest functioning group, and that also plays out in their functional scores. So the, the Lawton is really, really good. The INPH grading scale is more toward the left. The modified Rankin, it looks like there's more people affected, uh, and that, I think, is the insensitivity of the, the modified Rankin. So now let's talk about acquired. Uh, and these are patients that all of you have seen in one form or another. Um, subarachnoid hemorrhage, traumatic brain uh, injury, intracerebral hemorrhage with intraventricular hemorrhage, meningitis, and, and so forth. So uh, they're similar to transition insofar as the cause of their hydrocephalus plays a role in their impairment. Uh, and that's, in fact, the challenge for a lot of them. You're trying to figure out, all right, their ventricles are big. Is that because the brain's been injured and it's finally melted away because that's what happens to injured brain? Or is that really enlarging of, of the ventricles? And at the time that they came into the registry, 60% had not been treated. And so there's no guidelines for what to do with, with these patients. And I, I think if you talk to the PIs at our different centers, we each take slightly different approaches, but it's sort of local wisdom and experience. <clears throat> Excuse me. So here are their uh, etiologies. Uh, brain tumor was uh, at, at the top uh, for this group. Um, some of them simply had had brain surgery that related to it. There's your non-traumatic traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage, which is the aneurysms and head trauma. And then down at the bottom, a list of some others like vasculitis, uh, radiation, um, um, and not sure how cerebral ischemia due to small vessel disease got on there, but that's what somebody put down for the, the diagnosis as the cause of the hydrocephalus. Um, their function tends to be worse. Um, the, the, a lot of these patients can't do the MOCA because they are so severely impaired, so we can only show the scores for the patients who are able to do it. Uh, so that tends to be less than the uh, unrecognized congenital. Their symbol digits is less. Uh, their boone gate score is very flat. You see how the second one from the bottom, there's sort of this pretty flat distribution. Same thing for their, their gait velocity. So those who can walk often are going to have a spastic gait or a hemiplegic gait. Uh, some of them are going to be using walkers and so forth. Bladder score is sort of the same thing. There are quite a few who are normal for their bladder scores at, at the very bottom. Let me see if this works. Does it do what I want it to do? Oh, wait. Hang, there we go. I've never used a pointer like this one before, so there's, their, there's their, their bladder scores down there. So a lot of them are good here, but then spread out like that. Their functional scores show you the same story. Uh, again, up here, sorry if I can make this work again. Uh, at the top, uh, some of them are good, but there's this spread out here. Uh, this is their INPH scale, and then this is their uh, modified ranking. So then the, the last group here is the group that neurologists see. And this is the suspected INPH group. And I want to be really clear about this. This is not diagnosed INPH. This is suspected INPH. Family physician, primary physician sends the patient to you <clears throat> and says, they're shuffling and they're peeing on themselves and they're misplacing their keys. That must be hydrocephalus. Uh, or maybe they got a scan and that radiologist said ventricular enlargement, disproportionate to sulcal atrophy, and they get sent to you. So the only requirement was that they were referred for the question and they had large ventricles and Evans ratio above 0.3. So this is all comers in this age group. So this is actually giving you a profile of who gets referred to us. 
not a profile of NPH itself. So some of them you're going to see were normal, and some of them were quite impaired. Uh, we now in the network have, uh, I think, about 300 patients who have been put into this category, and, and we're in the early stages of collating that data un to understand how do they go through the diagnostic process, how many of them actually get shunted, and so forth. Uh, the other large cohort that's been published of a similar registry comes out of Sweden uh, to, to show what happens to those patients, although one of the shortcomings of, of the, the Swedish registry is they don't keep track of the patients who don't have hydrocephalus, and, and we're trying to do that. So here are their scores from top to bottom, and uh, for, here we go, there's your MOCA, and if you, if you, if you know the MOCA, basically 26 and higher, or depending on age, uh, maybe 25 or 24, is considered normal. So there, there's quite a few who are up here, but look at that spread down to the, to the left of, of lower scores. Um, and I gotta tell you, it's really painful to do a MOCA for somebody who only gets three or four points. It's really painful to, to, to do that. Uh, this is their single digits test. Uh, they tend to be lower. Some of them are really, really good. 40 or 50, that's fast for the symbol digits, but a lot of them are down here. Uh, next is the depression scale, and let me just say that there is no difference in depression across the, the groups, uh, and probably not any higher than, than the usual population. Uh, next is gait velocity. So for the elderly, and I should have told you this earlier, uh, but for the elderly, one meter per second or less is considered abnormal. So most of them, in fact, are down here. But there's a few of our Seattleites and, and others around the country who are very brisk walking elderly patients. You see them out there on the trails uh, here, here in the Pacific Northwest. The GAIT score is a little bit flatter, and I think it's interesting. The, the GAIT score for Boone would suggest that there's more difficulty uh, across the board in these patients, and then lastly is, is the bladder. So there's a few of them who have no bladder problems, but a lot of them who have a lot of bladder problems, and that makes sense for the elderly population. <clears throat> Here are their functional scores. Again, uh, the, the Lawton shows quite a few of them are, are good up there at the top, uh, but at quite a spread for the Lawton. Higher is worse for the Lawton, so these are quite disabled patients up here. Uh, here is the INPH grading scale, and then here is the modified rank in there. So now let's put the whole cohort together, because this is really where I learned a lot about this field. And this really does represent the entire spectrum of adult hydrocephalus. <clears throat> and again, let's see if I can do this from uh, left to right. The first column is transition, unrecognized congenital, acquired, and suspected INPH. So in the very order that I presented that to you. Uh, and the first thing is that if you go and, and look at the cognitive test, so that's the MOCA and the SDMT, when we ran the statistical analysis comparing these groups, the first thing that comes out is the unrecognized congenital is better than all of the other groups. And <coughs> excuse me, the INPH is worse. Suspected INPH is worse than all the other groups. Uh, <clears throat> so it makes sense again with the populations that we see. Next, if we come down here to gait velocity, <clears throat> the INPH group is the slowest, is the worst compared to all of the others. Uh, same thing with the Boone gait score, INPH is worse, the unrecognized congenital is the best, and then for the bladder, <clears throat> interestingly, the INPH, not surprisingly, is the worst. The transition is the best. As I, as I said before, we didn't anticipate when we were the registry that we would need to take into account self-catheterization and uh, Mitrofenov catheters. <clears throat> the functional scores show some similar issues. Let me see if I can get a glass of water. Thanks. Sorry about that. So uh, again, on functional scores, the unrecognized congenital turns out better than anybody else. So really high functioning, and we think that that's from their simple etiologies. Suspected INPH is clearly 
worse, although again, there are quite a few patients in suspected INPH who are doing quite well up here. The next thing that comes out, and I, I use the INPH, thank you very much, uh, as, as a way of showing the differences between the grading scales, and I think this is really important for epidemiologic research or registry research, is that these scores, these are the three scores applied to the very same patients. And, and look at those distributions, look at those histograms. Uh, if you go at the bottom, which is the modified Rankin, you'd think, boy, a lot are doing really, really bad. Uh, and sort of the same thing for the INPH grading scale. But if you go up to the Lawton, which again looks at what can they do or can't they do and how much help do they need, you see a different distribution. And so I actually think that for, for this population, the Lawton is telling us a lot more about their functional outcomes than these other grading scales. Uh, and to me, that suggests that the, the grading scales may be first of all, insensitive, but secondly, a bit too pessimistic about what's going on with this population. The other thing to take note of, if you look at, at the Lawton, for example, uh, is that there's a lot of patients across all the categories who have very little impact at all. And even I tend to think of the transition population and the acquired population and not so much the unrecognized congenital as having a lot of impairment. In fact, they're doing quite well. So you can have patients uh, on your patient panel with hydrocephalus who are perfectly normal, and you may have some who are going to have a lot of impairment and disability. So, you know, we said for all of the groups uh, that we would look at their treatment status, and starting from the left, by definition, the transition group had to have been treated. Makes sense. And by definition, we said the suspected INPH group should not be treated. Uh, but if you look at the, the bottom row that's outlined in the red, overall, excluding transition, 80% of the patients who came in our door were not treated. 80%. And so that means we're trying to figure out, do they need a shunt? Do they, in fact, have hydrocephalus? And is that a significant contributor to their symptoms? Which is sort of a lead into the issue of differential diagnosis for these patients. Now, for suspected IPH, we have the guidelines, um, both the Japanese guidelines and the international guidelines. And, and they're very, very similar. They're not identical. For the acquired and the um, uh, unrecognized congenital, there are no guidelines. So people are, are taking different approaches at different centers. And because there is so much differential diagnosis that's involved, uh, I, I think this is a group where neurologists do need to be seeing these patients. You know, and I've worked with neurosurgeons very closely for, for 30 years. I will tell you that when I took over the hydrocephalus program at, at UW, which had been run for several years by neurosurgeons, they shunned a lot of patients I would never put a shunt into because their thoughts on differential diagnosis were not. Um, and I, I should say, uh, any, any of you work with Sarah Folks when she was here? Uh, so she actually, a number of years ago, came out to Baltimore to learn about the program that we had in, in Baltimore. So some of the things that she came back and started up here are sort of uh, secondary to the, the work that we had done by that point. So <clears throat> let me just say about comorbidities, and there's a lot, and I've only highlighted a few of them for you. Seizures are greatest in the two groups that make sense to you, the transition group and the acquired group. So 13% of the acquired group have seizures. Um, down here where it says um, spine, that's probably spina bifida. We actually didn't specifically say spina bifida, but in the transition group, if it's spine not including stenosis, then roughly 28%. Uh, and then down here, no comorbidities. So this is unrecognized congenital. These are these healthy adults coming in the door. 40% of them, no comorbidities. Suspected INPH, only 15% no comorbidities, which means 85% of them have comorbidities. Uh, and that's the game that we play in adult hydrocephalus, so 85% of them. And that, that reflects their, their age. So uh, some simple lessons there. <clears throat> Transition and acquired demonstrate that if you have a bad etiology, you're going to have worse outcomes. 
unrecognized congenital shows that if you have a simple etiology, you're going to have better outcomes. And in fact, I think there's lessons to be learned in this unrecognized congenital group about what actually comes just from hydrocephalus as opposed to all the other comorbidities. They're, they're the closest that we have to a pure hydrocephalus population. Uh, and then the lack of comorbidities in the unrecognized group is less impairment. So this is the, the first study that's looked at all of these groups. Um, and um, the, the registry is now about twice as old at this point, so we've got twice as many patients now. Uh, all of the, the centers are specialty centers, so this may or may not represent what's out there in the U.S. and, and Canada. It's, it's hard to know, uh, but it's, it's the first cross-section that helps us to understand what's going on. I think contrary to what may be a popular belief, uh, adult hydrocephalus is a lot more than just INPH. And most of the time when I talk to neurologists, that's all that they think about. There's these other categories. And more than 40% of them had hydrocephalus of childhood onset, whether it was the transition or the unrecognized congenital. And 80% of them are untreated at the time of enrollment. So that's a big issue for us. And I'm going to spend the last few minutes, I'm going to skip this slide, and talk about clinical approach to INPH, because Mike said, can you say a few words about INPH as well? <coughs> So, quite honestly, if you want what I personally think is the world's best review article on INPH, it's mine. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but uh, important, it, it reflects how I think. So Jan Malm uh, is, is my co-author. Jan is a neurologist from Umia, Sweden. Umia is about as far, as far north as, as Fairbanks. It's a really wonderful university town uh, and a terrific university hospital. And they have this uh, multi-center system for adult hydrocephalus throughout Sweden. Uh, so uh, Jan and I wrote this together. And I will be on the editorial board for Continuum, which is the American Academy of Neurology's educational journal. So I knew that every neurology resident in the US and Canada and most of the world got this journal for free. So my ulterior motive was, in fact, to prime the neurology residents and future neurologists how to think about this disorder, because there's certainly a lot of people who don't believe in the disorder out there, and including the chief editor of one of our, our major journals who blows a gasket every time somebody suggests that NPH is, is a real deal. Uh, I'm actually on the steering committee for the update in the international guidelines. They're more than 15 years old at this point, and they need to be updated. So let's start with something that you probably don't know. Uh, but the group in Gothenburg, Sweden, published a paper in neurology uh, back in 2014 looking at their national data uh, and said about 0.2% of people between age 70 and 79 had probable INPH based on clinical criteria and scans, and maybe 6% of those above age 80 had that. So I took those numbers and I went to the U.S. Census uh, and made the calculation that maybe 700,000 people in the U.S have probable INPH. These are people who need to be worked up for INPH. Hmm. So how do you think that compares to brain tumor? I know we have a neuro-oncologist in the room. MS or myasthenia gravis? You guys need your coffee. <laughs> so here's the numbers. <clears throat> this is as much probable INPH as there is brain tumor. Now, my sources for these numbers are the sites for brain tumor and MS and myasthenia. So they have a vested interest in those numbers. And I can tell you that virtually every academic medical center in the United States and lots of tertiary centers like here have brain tumor programs and MS programs and neuromuscular programs. And there's probably not more than 10 or 15 centers across all of the U.S. that have dedicated adult hydrocephalus programs. And that's just INPH. That's not all the others that we talked about a few minutes ago. So if this data from Sweden is correct, we have a very underserved population. So do you guys use this heuristic mental shortcut, dementia, impaired gait, impaired bladder control? And the residents keep telling me wacky, wobbly, and wet. And I got to tell you, people don't, patients with this disease don't like that term uh, because they're not wacky. It's cognitive impairment. They're not wobbly. They're shuffling. Uh, 
uh, and they're not necessarily wet. Um, but what's wrong with this heuristic, this mental shortcut? And it's that it's an elderly population. They're more than age 65, and these are the three most common problems of getting older. And if you don't take the time as a neurologist to go through the differential diagnosis of each of these symptoms, you're going to make bad decisions. You're going to shunt the wrong people and not shunt the wrong people. And so differential diagnosis is key. Has this man or woman made it to your clinic yet? It's a <clears throat> large group of what we see in geriatric neurology. These are the patients who get sent to us. Um, we uh, wrote a paper a few years ago about differential diagnosis. You know some of the common ones, vascular dementia, frontotemporal Lewy body, uh, cervical stenosis, lumbar stenosis. About once every two or three years, I, I get somebody who's sent in and they've got just profound sensory ataxia that nobody's picked up on before. So you, you really have to know how to, to look at, at their, their gait. Um, and, and so you, you really have to take a good history. You have to do a good exam. It's a comprehensive exam that you're doing with these folks. And the real principle is this. When somebody sends you a patient for possible INPH, the first thing you have to do is everything that you can to prove that it's not. And it's only when you haven't been able to prove that it's not INPH that you then go forward for additional testing. And this is something that's actually in the guidelines and something that we have to teach over and over again. So you're saying it's a diagnosis of exclusion? Well, no. I'm just saying before you get to the testing that's specific for it. Um, and again, if I can make somebody get better by fixing their cervical stenosis, then I don't have to invoke the hydrocephalus. Now, sometimes that doesn't do the trick, and we do come back and, and look into it. So uh, let me give you a few things on, on the imaging. So the, the uh, guidelines say an Evans ratio of more than 0.3. No obstruction to CSF flow, and there's about 10% of the elderly population who, in fact, have obstructive hydrocephalus but present with an INPH syndrome. They all have white matter hyperintensitives to some degree or another. Um, there's a lot of folks around here in the Pacific Northwest who are sending patients for these aqueductal flow velocity studies. Waste of time. It's an utter waste of time. There's no reliability to that method for making the diagnosis of hydrocephalus. All that it tells you is that the aqueduct is patent. But you can't repeat it on the same patient on the same scanner and get the same value. And you can't make any comparisons between two different scanners. And, and the folks in our field who have really looked at this have said, you know, it was a great idea when it was conceived 20 years ago, but it's just not, it's just not catching uh, traction. It doesn't help you to answer the question that you're interested in. So when I start to look at a scan, I always go to the sagittal view first. Uh, and I look at the corpus callosum and I look at the aqueduct. And the scan on the left is a pretty normal sagittal view. And the scan on the right is what we talk about when we say Boeing, not the airplane company, and effacement of the corpus callosum. Corpus callosum is the roof of the ventricles. So if your ventricles are expanding, they will expand up as much as they will expand out. And so if you've got somebody who looks like they have big ventricles on the axial view, but that corpus callosum is flat, that's probably atrophy. That's what Alzheimer's disease looks like. Now, in Alzheimer's disease, it'll be flat and thin because there's some loss of, of the fiber tracts going back and forth through the, the corpus callosum. Here's a web across the aqueduct in, in an elderly patient, and you can see some of the anatomy of the floor of the third ventricle. Um, and you really do need to take the time to, to look for that, especially if there's a lot of bullying. And look at the floor of the third ventricle. If it looks like it's pushed downward, get some additional studies to see is that aqueduct blocked or not. This is the only subset of patients in the suspected INPH category for whom ETV may work. For general communicating hydrocephalus and the INPH syndrome, ETV doesn't work. Yeah? Uh, where is the web? Can you point that out? Here and here. Okay. <clears throat> so you got to look at that. So this sequence, depending on which scanner you have, is either called Fiesta, I call it CIS, C -I -S -S. the neurosurgeons like the Celtic C, they call it KISS. Uh, but I, I call it cis. Now, the Japanese have this thing called DESH, Disproportionately Enlarged Subarachnoid Space Hydrocephalus. It's been around for more than a 12, 15 years. It took me a long time to figure out what they meant by it, but I now understand. 
Uh, and so there's three components to it. One is the ventricles are large, which makes sense. The next is what we're seeing at the top, which is that the uh, convexity is up against the calvarium, and the hemispheres are pushed together. So there's almost no interhemispheric fissure that you can see there. So that's called the high and tight approach. And then the third, which is shown by the red arrow on the right, is dilation of the sylvian fissure. Now the, the problem with that is you can see that in atrophic diseases as well. And in fact, I know from my own experience that I was probably seeing that for a long, long time, but reading it as, as atrophy. And then the other one is that occasionally you'll get these little sulcal pockets like this. And the notion that CSF is trying to get up to the arachnoid granulations to be reabsorbed. It can't get there, so it's pushing the brain up and it's dilating the, the sylvian fissure. The Japanese are actually shunting patients on the basis of clinical exam and DASH. A lot of centers around the world have tried to look at how specific that is. It's probably not as specific, or as sensitive rather, uh, as, as it needs to be. So there's a lot of patients with INPH who don't have this DASH pattern. Uh, and it's not clear whether everybody with the DASH pattern actually has symptomatic IMPH. So that, that's an issue that's still being unfolded. But I look for it because I, I think it, it helps me. It's a bit more information. Uh, this is what it looks like on the axial view. And there you can see on the top left corner what high and tight looks like on a P2 sequence. Bottom right is how to measure the Evans ratio, the diameter of the frontal horns and the widest diameter on that same slice and above 0.3. That's really a crude measure. Uh, but it, it, it's a, a guideline to look for that. So the problem with wacky, wobbly, and wet is that people shunt the wrong patients. <clears throat> it's the wrong heuristic. And I want you as neurologists to think about frontal subcortical cognitive impairment, neurologic gait impairment, and neurologic bladder impairment. So the dementia, you know this, you've got dementia experts, apathy, <clears throat> psychomotor slowing. They can't handle things at home. They can't write their checkbook. Uh, they're slow. Uh, they probably are losing their driving skills because their reaction times are down. But you need to look for things that don't make sense. So things for FTD or things for Alzheimer's disease. So impaired language or naming, rapid forgetting, an amnestic pattern is not typical. Delirium is not typical. Hallucinations is not typical. Failure to recognize family or loss of autobiographical memory is not typical. And if you see those things, you need to step back and ask, is there something else in addition to hydrocephalus or is it something else entirely? Um, so you, you have to ask, and you really have to screen for FTD and Alzheimer's and Lewy. And I'll tell you, Lewy can fool you. I have been fooled by Lewy body uh, because they have these spontaneous fluctuations in their exam, and you have, have the misfortune of doing a lumbar puncture on them the day before they get better. Then you're going to think that you know you walk on water and you've diagnosed NPH, and then they get a shunt and they're not going to get better. Um, you also have to look at the dimension relationship to the gait. <clears throat> I like the MOCA as a screening tool. I think the mini mental is something that belongs in the Smithsonian uh, at this point, but not in your, your uh, files for clinical care. Uh, and I do send patients for neuropsych testing. If I think something else is going on, if I need clarification, I'll send them for neuropsych. And every once in a while, I'll get PET scans on these patients. So gait <clears throat> is probably one of the most complex tasks that we as humans do uh, because it involves the entire nervous system and, and the skeletal system and the joints and, and so forth. You actually learn a lot about gait by watching patients walk. So you have to take all of that into account when you're assessing what's going on. And you're really looking at two things. One is locomotion. Can I get from here to there? So that's walking. It's rhythmic smooth, you don't even think about it. The other is your balance, postural reflexes. If we didn't have postural reflexes, we would all fall over like a broomstick. Uh, and so these postural reflexes are going on all of the time. And it's not just the inner ear and proprioception and, and vision, but there's, there's motor reflexes, complex motor reflexes that, that are in there. So the, the work that I really like is the work of John Nutt from OHSU looking at lower level, middle level, and higher level gait disorders. Uh, and the, the paper from 1993 in, in neurology first caught my eye a long time ago. And he, he sort of uh, plays this out for you. 
but here's a higher level gait disorder. It's going to sound familiar to you. Difficulty integrating this sensory information about the position of the body in its environment. Sitting, standing, moving, including the effect of gravity. And they have disturbed or absent postural and locomotor reflexes. But they don't have a primary sensory motor deficit. Patients will say they're weak, but when you do the motor exam, they're normal. And their sensory exam is normal. So you, you have this disparity between their complaints and what's going on. And this is frontal cortex and subcortical connections in basal ganglia. So you're going to see this in, uh, in part of Parkinson's gait is, is this. Uh, part of uh, the gait impairment of vascular dementia is from this. Um, but they have a normal neurological exam. And these disorders are really difficult to diagnose. And these are the five features to look for. So freezing of gait or turns, which includes gait initiation failure. They just can't get going or they walk a few steps and stop and walk a few steps and stop. I had a patient classic for that yesterday. Absent or counterproductive postural responses. You try to stand them up and they have retropulsion. Or they're sitting on the edge of the bed or the exam table. And you have to keep putting your hand behind their back because they're tipping backwards. So even retropulsion when, when they're seated. Uh, transitional movements. This is where the complaints about falling in the bathroom or falling when getting up from the, the, the barca lounger in the living room is a problem. <clears throat> Variability in gait. Good gait is consistent gait. Go out to um, Broadway uh, or just watch people walking around the hospital. People with normal gait don't even think about it. They're very consistent, very consistent. This gait is variable. And all of them, their spouses are going to swear, I can't believe she walked this well for me today. This is not what she does at home. So when you hear that story, you want to watch both what they're doing on formal exam, but watch them when they're leaving and they don't know that you're watching them. And you'll see that. Or just watch how they walk across the exam room compared to walking out in the hallway. Um, so uh, NPH is a classic higher level gait disorder. <clears throat> If you see spasticity or hyperreflexia, stop and think. That's not typical. It's not impossible. It's just not typical. They will tell you that they have imbalance, but it's not vertigo. You shouldn't see asymmetry in INPH. Uh, this is the Tenetti assessment tool, getting back to the question about gait. Mary Tenetti wrote this scale back in 1986. I like it a lot. I don't think she wrote it with this in mind because John Nutt hadn't written his paper about higher level gait dysfunction. But it's, in my view, it's a really, really good score to look for higher level gait dysfunction. It takes a little bit of time to learn how to do this. A good patient, you can get this done in about two minutes. Somebody who's bad, you might take three or four minutes. But you have to look at the gait yourself. You have to be a good neurologist and look at the gait yourself. A couple words on incontinence. Lots of different ways to be incontinent when you're old. But what's characteristic of hydrocephalus is urinary urgency and difficulty inhibiting bladder emptying. I got to go. I can't get to the toilet in time. They've started to wear Depends or a pad or sometimes old guys put a Kleenex in their pants as if that's going to do anything. But that's what old guys do. They find ways to, to compensate for that. They can't walk very fast, so they've got this really strong urge to get to the toilet, and they're shuffling, and they're going to start to empty their bladder before they can get to the, the toilet. You really have to distinguish the other causes. If a man has had prostate surgery in the past, you need to ask, how is this pattern now compared to before and right after you had your prostate surgery? Uh, for women, you have to say, is this a change in the bladder symptoms that you might have had since middle age or since you had your kids and so forth? So you really have to find out, is this any different? If they're incontinent and don't know it, again, stop and look for other causes. And I, I'm thinking about spinal cord if patients are insensate for their bladder or sometimes bad diabetes. So um, it's a really complex disorder. And the differential diagnosis takes a tremendous amount of work. And, and that's most of what I do for this population. I think that neurologists play an incredible role in screening patients and figuring out who then needs to get sent for a TAP test or extended lumbar drainage, which I'm not going to talk about today. Um, but you know, there are lots of additional tests or consultations that you may need to order. Uh, and I know Michael has already uh, uh, talked to me about some of his patients. I'm just up the street uh, at Harborview. I'm in the 9th and Jefferson building there. And I'm happy to help you with any of your patients. So thank you for having me over. <clears throat>
Yes. Um, for patients with adult unrecognized uh, congenital hypothalamus, yeah. So um, we have this tendency to think that um, the brain has reached a point where uh, CSF is probably moving across the appendum, back and forth. And in fact, in all of us, there is trafficking of, of CSF back and forth across the appendum. This is what the, the glymphatic system is, is all about. But it can only compensate so much. Uh, and, and the notion is that they've sort of exhausted those alternate pathways for CSF circulation. And, and that may simply be aging, normal aging effect on top of long-standing hydrocephalus. Um, now the other possible way that they could be getting worse is that in fact the hydrocephalus is the same, but the brain is a chronically injured brain and you're superimposing aging on a chronically injured brain and the decompensation is just normal aging on top of that. So the way that I try to sort that out uh, is intracranial pressure monitoring, particularly if they have obstructive hydrocephalus. I don't want to put a shunt into these patients unless I can demonstrate that the intracranial pressure physiology is abnormal for them. So I'll have the surgeon put in a, a bolt or a Camino monitor and record them overnight. And that's an entirely different lecture. The mistake that everybody makes is just to look at the mean number and you actually have to look at the dynamics of the intracranial pressure to look for impaired uh, craniospinal compliance for, for that. Um, but you know, if they're asymptomatic, you, uh, most of us aren't going to study these patients to see whether their pressure is, is abnormal or not. I, I think it's actually a challenging group. I tend to be on the conservative side. If they're normal, I usually won't do anything. If they're working, I'll get a baseline neuropsych eval on them. Because where they're going to get into trouble, if they get into trouble, is decompensation of their cognitive skills. So they'll be a bit abnormal at baseline, just because their brain has grown up around hydrocephalus. But the, if you then document a drop off in function, then that's a clinical indicator that they may be getting worse. It's also useful if you have to go the disability route or, or uh, work with the employer for, for uh, reasonable accommodations. In the back. Uh, yes, could you please comment on the utility of a, uh, first define what a high volume tap is, and number two, the utility of a slow lumbar drain to diagnose <coughs> Sure, sure. Uh, I've done both of those um, for many, many years. Um, so the thing about the lumbar puncture for hydrocephalus is you have to know what a shunt is. A shunt's a leak, a chronic CSF leak. Uh, and so if you do the same lumbar puncture for hydrocephalus that you're doing on your MS patient, you're actually doing it wrong. You want a leak. You want a large volume. And this elderly population, very interestingly, rarely gets a post-LP headache. I, I can count on one hand the number of my elderly patients who've had a post-LP headache over the last 30 years. It's, it's quite uncommon. And part of it may be that they're older and more resilient. Uh, younger people are quite sensitive to it. Uh, the next is I use an 18-gauge needle. I actually do them seated because the opening pressure doesn't tell you anything. And if you do them seated, then the, the interspace opens up a little bit better. You fill up your tube faster. You know, the standard kit in the US has four tubes. And if you fill them up to the very, very top, you might get eight milliliters. So altogether, you're getting about 30. Uh, Carson Wickelso from Gothenburg first described it uh, around 30 years ago. He likes to get 50 milliliters if he can. I think if you can get between 30 and 35, you're in, in good shape. Um, the next is you absolutely have to evaluate the gait first. In fact, when I walk to clinic from here, I'm doing a lumbar puncture on a patient. You have to evaluate the gait, do the lumbar puncture. I send them out for lunch, brunch, because I want them upright, active, leaking, and then come back and re-examine them after lunch about three or four hours later. Uh, but the reason to have them active is because then you're getting this evaluation by the patient and family in a real life circumstance as well. Uh, if they definitely re respond, and you, this is why you have to see the gate yourself, quantify it before and afterwards, then you can send them for a shunt. If they don't respond, you can't reach a conclusion. ELD uh, involves admission to the hospital. Um, again, I've been doing this uh, for, for 30 years. 
Uh, you insert a spinal catheter. Most of us drain at a rate about 10 cc's per hour. It's roughly a third of CSF production rate uh, and probably twice as fast as a shunt normally flows. But in, in essence, you're mimicking the effect of a shunt. And because it's over between 36 and 72 hours, depending on the center, you have a longer duration of it. Uh, and if a patient responds to ELD, again, examining them before and afterwards, there's a very high chance that a shunt will make them get better. If they don't respond, probably only about a 10% chance that the shunt would make them get better. And <clears throat> the um, research network has just finished um, a very careful systematic review of the literature on ELD and, um, you know, much to my own dismay, but probably not a surprise, uh, we don't really know what the negative predictive value is of, of that. Uh, and there's, there's some people who are suggesting that we may not need any of these predictive tests at all for patients if we've gone through the process of excluding other disorders. I'm almost at that point where I'm, I'm willing to, to do that, and I think that that's a future study that could be done. Uh, the thing I really like about both of these approaches is that if the patient responds and everybody agrees that they've responded, you really don't have to twist their arms about getting a shunt. And people go out on the internet, they read about shunts, and they come in and most of them are scared of shunts. If they haven't responded, usually everybody sees that too. And in, in my own experience, it's roughly 60% get sent for a shunt and 40% don't. And it's rare for me to have to say to a family, I know you think you're seeing something, but you know the physical therapists haven't seen it, I haven't seen it, I can't recommend a shunt. Every once in a while, they're really insistent, and we will do that, but with a lot of conversation. Uh, but I, I still think that those are uh, the best ways to try to figure out in an elderly and sometimes frail population whether the risk of surgery is, is worth it. One more question here. Oh, actually, I'm going to take in front first, since. Um, this is some girl with large volume obesity. Never seen it. And then why aren't we using more advanced imaging techniques like um, directional diffusion measurements and white matter tracks and things like that to see if it improves? Because it seems to me we need a more um, scientific, quantitative... Yep. Something. Yeah, we need biomarkers. We need, we need supplemented biomarkers, whether it's change in CSF or change in something in the MRI. There's been a lot of research to look at it. There's not a lot that's holding water. Um, the group from Gothenburg has just published a paper that suggests that the biomarker profile in idiopathic normal pressure hydrocephalus is very distinct from Alzheimer's and FTD and, and, and so forth. And this is a really, really good group in, in Gothenburg. I haven't had the chance to, to read that com completely, but you're absolutely right. We, we need augmented diagnosis.